I think maybe we should uh, start. Oh, here we go. Uh, uh, my name is Peter Hall, and um, uh, I, uh, uh, this is a panel on um, Stanley Hoffman, scholar, teacher, and friend. The two previous panels have given us a chance to think about and appreciate uh, his ideas in the spheres of international relations and French politics, European politics, uh, which I think has been actually been quite remarkable. Uh, uh, but we wanted to have also a panel in which people could appreciate him in uh, more or less intellectual terms as a teacher and a friend as well as a scholar. Uh, and of course, this is a rather difficult thing to do. I mean, the crucial uh, dividing line one has to establish here is between a birthday party uh, and a funeral, where <laughs> the perorations are broadly speaking lugubrious, or a wedding where they're, um, without mentioning uh, any names uh, of weddings that I, people I've attended here, where the where the perorations are sometimes ridiculous. It's a so pre posthumous service. <laughs> pre posthumous, right? So we'll, the panelists are going to be relatively brief, and uh, we'll hope to give a chance to others here to um, uh, uh, tell us about um, recollections that uh, you have, if you, if you would like. The, and uh, since we might not fit everyone in, I should mention the website, which uh, David mentioned at the outset. Uh, there is a little part of the website where you can um, add your own uh, reminiscence. Now, I mention this again because a uh, young reporter for The Crimson interviewed me two days ago because I gather The Crimson is writing a story about this uh, event. I don't know if it's appeared. Uh, and I said to her, well, you know, there are these fabulous uh, memoirs of, about, of Stanley on the website. And she said, well, I saw the space for them, uh, but there's only one there. I think it's very sad. And I said to her, you have to click on next page. <laughs> so I mention that to any of you who think it's somewhat sad. But, So as, as a number of you will have noted, um, the, what I hope are the very last of the tapes from Richard Nixon were released last week, uh, and they have him saying to Henry Kissinger, almost 36 years ago to the day, 36 years ago next week, uh, Nixon says to Kissinger, uh, the professors are the enemy. Yeah. Pro <laughs> professors are the enemy. Write that on a blackboard a hundred times and never forget it. And of course, with respect to Stanley Hoffman, he was correct. <laughs> so appropriately, we've asked four professors uh, to um, open this panel to lead off uh, this discussion devoted to personal reminiscence, uh, uh, more or less intellectual. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, I'm sorry, I, I should say that unfortunately, Diana Pinto uh, was unable to fly because of a very minor health problem, so not a major worry, but we're sorry to miss her, but we're very glad to have uh, Louise Richardson here, who is, has been the Administrative Dean of Radcliffe, as you know, and as was mentioned earlier, is becoming the Principal of uh, St. Andrews University uh, almost immediately. Uh, Michael Smith, who's the Thomas C. Sorensen Professor of Social and Political Thought at the University of Virginia. Uh, Linda Miller, who's the Professor of Political Science Emerita at Wellesley College and Adjunct Professor at Brown. And Gary Bass, who's Associate Professor of Politics and Public Affairs at Princeton University. So thank you all for doing this, and without ado, Louise, let me turn to you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Stanley, I hope you're enjoying this. I must say, I'm getting such a kick out of being in a room with so many people who have such shared experiences and, and people who are invoking 
uh, social analysis 12 as it was when, when I was a TF for it. Uh, I actually think being a TF is a much more profound experience uh, with Stanley than being a student, uh, because unlike the students, you actually have to do all the reading. Um, <laughs> um, if only to uh, prove to the students, uh, to the unbelieving students, that it is in fact possible to read everything on a Stanley Hoffman reading list and still have enough time to eat and show up for class. Um, but this, this is the light panel. Um, we've had two extraordinarily substantive uh, panels, so I'm delighted to be where I belong on, on the light one. And I will also be, uh, be, be very short, uh, because I know there's a great many people in this room who would also like Stanley to hear their reminiscences of their time with him, and I'm sure, and I know he wants to hear that too. Um, I should say, I was actually very concerned to be speaking late in the day um, at a conference in honor of Stanley Hoffman. Not because I was concerned that I would be short of nice things to say about Stanley. I could happily say nice things about Stanley until the cows come home, as they say where I come from. Um, my concern was that anything I would say would actually have been anticipated by others speaking earlier. Um, and having been well trained by Stanley, I knew that I had to make three points. Um, and I have three points, but I was still concerned that they would be made by others. Um, so I decided to, to rely on my family for a little help. Um, yesterday, I was at home and wondering what I would say, and I turned to my 17-year-old daughter, and I said, Fiona, I want to say something about Stanley at a conference, but I'm speaking late, and I'm worried other people will have already said the same thing. To which she replied instantly, oh, Stanley, He's such a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, thank you, Fiona. I'm, I'm pretty certain nobody else is going to say that. <laughs> uh, but being a teacher through and through, having been uh, trained by the best teacher of them all, I couldn't resist uh, saying to her what I always say when students make uh, unexpected points. I said, interesting point, Fiona, but I wonder, could you elaborate? <laughs> to which she replied, every time I see Stanley, I just want to give him a big hug. <laughs> now, I should say that Fiona and her siblings, like most teenagers, do not naturally speak so glowingly about grown-ups. They are generally devastating in their insight and their criticism of grown-up hypocrisy, banality, and so on, ad infinitum. The speed at which they disappear upstairs any time adults come into the house make Houdini look slow. But this is not the case on the two rare occasions when Inga and Stanley come to our house. And I think what appeals to them is Stanley's sense of empathy, his irreverence, and sense of fun his complete lack of regard for the rules. Like them, he's happy to start with dessert. Um, <laughs> but, but also his complete inability to speak to them in the predictable ways that most uh, adults speak to teenagers, which my teenagers experience as being judged and categorized. Um, my youngest child actually came in on this conversation. Uh, my youngest child is uh, Rory, who is 14, who is Sandy's godson. And uh, he said, what are you guys talking about? And I said, I'm, I'm trying to understand what it is you guys like about Stanley. And he said, oh, mom, that's so easy. He's just such a nice man. So anyway, um, Stanley as teddy bear was not actually my first point. Um, my, uh, my, <laughs> my first point is a different one. I wanted to mention, uh, what I wanted to mention was Stanley's brilliance and insight in choosing a wife, Inga. We have all delighted in Inga's wit and grace. <laughs> we have all delighted in Inga's wit and grace, her sense of style and her sense of fun, her analysis of social and political life, and her affection for Stanley. They are so engaged with one another that whenever they do come to, to our house, they never fail to get lost, and always because <laughs> They are so engrossed in a conversation with one another that they forget the directions. Um, 
Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to invoke one of my daughters, 19-year-old Kira this time, and, and I should preface my quote from her by saying that when I recently asked Kira, as a matter of interest, how old is old, she said very sympathetically, I'm sorry, Mom, but once you reach 30, it's all over. <laughs> anyway, um, Kira and I were at the ART recently, and I looked across the theater and saw a woman uh, arrive dressed in a gorgeous multicolored jacket, and I turned to Kira and I said, Inga is here. Without missing a beat, uh, Kira gave the ultimate uh, teenage compliment. She said, uh, I love Inga. Inga is so cool. I want to be just like her when I'm old. <laughs> um, the, the <laughs> and old is 30. Um, the second point I want to make about uh, Stanley is slightly more serious. It's, it's Stanley the outsider. I think um, the acuity of his insight on the US, on Europe, on America, and France, I think is derived in large part from his not belonging to either, but knowing both so well. He has written himself about this far more eloquently than I can speak of it. But, but I think he, he thrives on being an outsider. I think people with far shorter tenure and far more tenuous ties to Harvard have wrapped themselves in its mantle and become of Harvard, but not, but not Stanley. Intellectually, he has in many ways remained an outsider here, and I'm not just talking to the place where he has perfected the role of the government department, but I mean the university more generally, while simultaneously contributing so much to this institution and to the intellectual development of so many students and colleagues who have passed through here during his tenure. Um, I, of course, have found it very easy to identify with this role of outsider, carrying two passports, as I do, and, and not feeling quite at home in either Ireland or America, and certainly not in Scotland, Lord knows. But, um, but I value this perspective, and I've seen how much it energizes Stanley's, Stanley's work. And I've tried very hard to pass it on to my children. Now, on, on their father's side, these three children have a, a direct line to the Mayflower, they have had an impeccably privileged New England prep school education, and yet nothing delights me more than seeing the emergence of three determined outsiders. It makes for a less comfortable life, but I think a more meaningful one, and one that positions them to contribute so much more as they have, as we have all observed Stanley do. And the third point I'd like to make is about uh, one of Stanley's weaknesses. I think we have been very kind all day, as befits the occasion. We have spoken about Stanley's many strengths, and we have, he has more than enough of them to keep us all very busy. But I have always felt that he has one significant and largely unacknowledged weakness. We know he has a razor-sharp mind that cuts through to the core of an issue in an instance, that his antenna for detecting duplicity and hypocrisy are finely tuned, and that his analysis of the weakness in another's argument is devastating in its precision. Earlier today, Bob Cohane referred to it, I think, as his relentlessly critical spirit. And yet, all of these qualities completely fail him when it comes to his friends. For a man of renowned insight, he is, in fact, I think, blind to the weaknesses of his friends. I know that I've been a beneficiary of this particular failing, and I mean no disrespect to any of you to say that I think many others in this room have too. <laughs> um, and I think of it as one of his most endearing qualities. Um, so finally, as, uh, as Stanley mentioned earlier, in, a, in three weeks I'm going to be uh, leaving this institution and this country, having spent my entire adult life here. And when I look back on my time here and, and what I have valued most about it, there is nothing I have valued more than the extraordinary privilege of being a student, a colleague, and a friend of Stanley's, um, to whom I owe so very much. There is simply nobody I will miss more. Happy birthday, Stanley. My name is Michael Smith, and I've made it this time. The last time uh, there was a big occasion like this, quite uncharacteristically, we were snowed in in Virginia while you were <laughs> quite happily here. But now there are at least as many uh, reasons to celebrate Stanley um, on this significant birthday as there are people in the room. But as Louise and others have already pointed out, these really all boil down to three. Stanley has been to all of us a teacher, an example, and a friend. 
First, Stanley has been, and he remains, of course, the teacher of all of us. From him, we learned how to read, how to analyze, how to criticize, but perhaps most of all, how to imagine. From him, we learned how to imagine an intellectual world where rigor and critical spirit and compassion can reinforce each other, where critique is tempered by understanding. My first experience of Stanley's teaching was of his lectures um, in uh, a now unlamented building, Lowell Lecture Hall, um, in who, uh, and I was a quite remarkably uninformed sophomore who in the fall of 1970 signed up for Social Sciences 112. The, the room, uh, which was cold and drafty, it's <laughs> was at least initially packed to the gills with students who apparently affected expected a year-long denunciation of American policy in Vietnam. They had heard that Stanley was an early and eloquent critic of the war, which of course he was, and somehow they thought the class would be a very relaxed and easy tirade for a year against American imperialism. Instead, of course, what we students got was already mentioned by Brian this morning, was vintage Stanley at his best explicating theorists ranging from Thucydides and Hobbes and Kant to Freud, William James, Lorentz, I think even Gordon Allport came in for it at one point, offering nuanced distinctions, subtly rich historical arguments, warnings about overweening social science. Remember, this was a full year class with three lectures a week and section meetings bi-weekly. As my TA in the class, Hugh Collins, has written, the course tackled the largest themes, the causes, the conditions, the consequences, control, and comprehension of organized conflict between states, close quote. It drew really upon an extraordinary range of disciplines, a geography, biology, anthropology, sociology, psychology, economics, history, and literature. Now, of course, as befits this range of disciplines, and as we all know, and as we've heard, another trademark of Stanley's classes was their prodigious reading assignment. There was always reading to do, a lot of reading to do. And I think by quirk of the schedule that year, we had apparently two days to read War and Peace. <laughs> um, I remember um, at one point in that whiny plus assertive way that uh, late 1960s students had, somebody raising their hand and saying, do you really expect us to read all this? Now, Stanley's bemused reply remains fixed in my memory, and forgive the bad imitation, but he said, well, <laughs> we have indicated the books to be discussed in section. If that isn't a hint, I don't know what is. <laughs> then, um, then, you know, it's not over. Then with timing worthy of Jack Benny, there's a long pause. Of course, the rest of the reading is merely essential. <laughs> now, now, half the audience groaned, half laughed as you did, um, but uh, it was really quite something. Now, in the spring section of the class, there was a rather depressing depra a parade of departures, because when people couldn't do, in those benighted, benighted days, one had to get one study card signed by professors to split a full year class. But I remember the spring actually as much more fun. We had abandoned Lowell Leck, for Emerson, and the room was much more engaging and intimate. And of course, by mid-spring, we got that extraordinarily lucid critique of American foreign policy in Vietnam that we all had been waiting for. Now, I had the good fortune, um, uh, as, as at Anne, to take both of Stanley's full year mega reading classes, both war and the class on France. And really, what a feast they were. I mean, all of us remember this. Stanley would, in some senses, inhabit the theorists he discussed, presenting them fully, fairly, and incredibly clearly. Of course, somehow they were always clearer in his lectures than they were on the page as you were turning them. Though there was always one, one funny exception. I remember uh, huge chunks of Hegel's philosophy of right were assigned in this class. And Stanley uh, was going, uh, after reading aloud a particularly opaque passage of Hegel, uh, looked up and said, you know, I've always found that some sentences in Hegel make as much s sense backwards as forwards. <laughs> and a truer word was never spoken, at least. 
<laughs> you know. At other times, when Stanley discussed people like Alain or Rousseau or Jean Jaurès, his admiration and delight in these people would almost radiate. But then he'd pull back and give his usual devastating critique and overall synthesis. You know, Stanley's courses and lectures, um, I think, presented an ideal of academic inquiry. And as Suzanne said earlier today, one in which it's a voice that we always hear and uh, it's a standard of lectures that we can almost never uh, uh, attain. We all cherish this and seek it uh, in our own teaching. You know, those elegant outlines that he would carefully write out on the board, his incomparably comprehensive approach to all the relevant literature in the field, his seemingly impossible command of that literature. Well, you know, this was real teaching. So I have to say it was, um, you know, really uh, a dream of mine to, to co-teach war with him and then to develop a new class, which he's still teaching with Brian on ethics and international affairs. In his individual direction, Stanley uh, has always been someone who helps people to develop their own arguments rather than assembling disciples or of setting himself as the founder of a school. Always aware of the flaws of an argument, he, as a patient teacher, helped you to find those flaws yourself, often, I think, with a gentleness that those who've only seen him at job talks or in a public setting might have found surprising. No, it's, it's true. I think, uh, and I think over the years, Stanley has adopted teaching as his primary vocation. It's not that he stopped writing incisive essays or books, but I think uh, increasingly he's come to think that teaching is where he makes the most difference. Certainly all of us who were fortunate to work with him um, uh, in our own way have our own stories of how he has helped us to find our own voices. I think that's what's unique about Stanley's teaching. He doesn't present you with a suit off the peg. He helps you to, uh, to uh, grow as a student yourself and find your own ideas and, and work them out. Block that metaphor, <laughs> right. <laughs> Sometimes he can be blunt, too. <laughs> now, we also learn from him how to imagine a world in which some justice was at least possible and how to pursue a notion of justice without the illusions that it would be easy, simple, or without the faith that it would undoubtedly succeed. Brian and I were talking about this in the break. I think Stanley shares Kant's sense of the duty to seek justice, but without Kant's consoling belief that reason will triumph in the end. For him, the warning at the end of the plague remains real. The rats are the always there to return to the happy city. Good people can, sometimes, though not often enough, as you heard him say earlier today, make a difference. The worst is not always sure to happen, but it might and we must be prepared to speak out against it and work against it. So that's number one, teacher. The other two are shorter. Second, Stanley has been and remains an example of how to live a life of integrity. You know, surrounded here at Harvard by people of great ambition and also as a student of power, he shows us what it means to be utterly incorrupted by, uncorrupted by both. He was never tempted to board the Cambridge Washington shuttle Someone, after all, had to stay around to speak truth and not sour grapes to power. He also avoided the typical academic temptation of self-righteousness. I, uh, I, I remember another rather noisy teach-in uh, in Viet on Vietnam in the fall of 1970. The panel included Michael Walzer, Richard Holbrook, Francis Fitzgerald, Noam Chomsky, and Stanley. Uh, Stanley, who had just published his piece on Vietnam and Algerian solution, question mark, got a hard time from the radical component in the audience because he insisted that um, the Americans had some responsibility to leave South Vietnam with some semblance of peace and order. The hero of the day, of course, was Chomsky, who denounced everyone, including his fellow anti-war panelists, as stooges of the imperial American war-making machine. Actually, on this particular occasion, uh, Michael Walzer had the last word, because at the end he sort of sighed and said, to think in Hebrew, Noam means pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, right. Anyway, virtually all of us can cite many examples of Stanley's, uh, Stanley's integrity and grace under pressure. 
most recently in his early and his consistent and uh, opposition to the Iraq War. He provides for us an example of the sheer force of ideas and ideals fiercely held, articulately pursued, and never, really never trimmed back when they may seem to others inconvenient or unpopular, when many may waver in the face of some new pseudo-patriotic solidarity, Stanley remained and remains an example of fidelity to core values of human dignity and justice for all. Third, and finally, and here I have to violate his horror at overt sentimentality, Stanley is our friend. And indeed, he has taught us and exemplified in his own unique way the meaning of true lifelong friendship. The presence of so many of his friends here today proves this point even perhaps beyond his capacity for critique. A deep empathy radiates through Stanley's seeming reticence, and I think all of us tonight know the joy of his solidarity with us. At times of happiness, as, as well as in difficult and even unbearable times of pain and loss, and there have been such times in our time here together, Stanley has been with us. I still meet people at conferences who ask me, uh, somewhat out of the blue, how is Rachel? Now, how would they know how my, how my daughter is? Well, because on the day she was born, Stanley substituted for me in Gov 40 to give the balance of power lecture. <laughs> and, he, and he announced why he was there, and it became a sort of festival of her birth. Um, and she, of course, turned out to be uh, uh, Inga and Stanley's goddaughter. So at times of joy like these and in times of pain, um, Stanley, we, we've all shared his friendship. And there have perhaps been many more times than he'll recall where his kindness, his sympathy, indeed even his willingness to be direct even when one knew he would rather not be. All this showed me, and I believe shows all of us, the true meaning of hum real humanity and true friendship. So Stanley, please, for today at least, bask in the uncritiqued joy and love that surrounds you here, and especially from one like me who feels honored call you his teacher, his example, and his truest friend. Uh, <coughs> my name is Gary Bass. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I want to talk about a slightly different aspect of uh, the experience of having Stanley as a teacher, which is uh, of having Stanley as a teacher when you're an undergrad. That I, uh, I got to know Stanley when I was 19 and basically an idiot. Um, and I want to, uh, to talk a little bit of that. It's, a, it's very easy when you have a very, very fancy title. Um, when I met Stanley, he was the C. Douglas Dillon Professor of the Civilization of France, um, which was a fantastic title, has been succeeded by an even more fantastic title. But it's easy when you have that kind of title to have people treat you with enormous respect. Harvard mandarins pay respect to other mandarins. But you can learn a lot, as Stanley would say, from seeing how society tr a society or a person treats their most vulnerable group. Um, and therefore, I think you can learn something about how Stanley treated the Harvard undergrads. He was, uh, from a distance, absolutely terrifying that to see him in Sever Hall. Um, he, wa he, he sort of was part of a cult of personality among Harvard professors. It's somewhat lesser than some of the other ones I saw. I will, um, Rod McFarker, who I took his class on the Cultural Revolution with, who had, us in had all of Sanders' theater waving our notebooks like little red books <laughs> and chanting Mao Zhu Shi Wan Sui, which means a thousand years to Chairman Mao as Rod stood there. Hi, Rod. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, um, Stan so Stanley toned it down a notch or two compared to some, but he, he was an awesome figure. He wore, uh, he wore the tragedy of the 20th century on his shoulders. He was supremely civilized even when uh, his subject was the management of barbarism, and in particular, European barbarism. Contrary to, he had the wrong title. The title should have been the professor of the barbarism of France. Um, he was critical of everything. He was even critical of Harvard College, which was absolutely shocking to Harvard undergrads. And you, could make, you could diss anything but that. And he had this incredibly bracing cynicism, which when you're 19, you hadn't really been exposed to. Um, he once mentioned in lecture, quote, 
he said he was talking about, and I won't do the, I won't do the voice, but um, <laughs> the liberal vision of international politics is harmonious. And then he just couldn't stand it and stopped and said, ha. <laughs> um, it seemed that he knew everything. It still seems that he knows everything. In fact, there was a thrilling moment once where he paused in the, in the middle of the lecture. He was discussing um, Albania under Enver Hoxha. That sort of came up peripherally. He paused to say, I am not an expert on Albania, nor do I wish to be. <laughs> and we were all sort of, wow, he's not an expert on and Then, of course, Yugoslavia blew up, and he, now he knows all about Albanians. Um, he had these legendarily terrifying syllabi, which were uh, actually very socially helpful to me, that I met one of my dear friends in college while I was in the coop buying the books for Moral Reasoning 28. And the weight of these books, I mean, th y you know, it, it was like this high, crush Jack Levy, um, the <laughs> um, crushing under this weight. And this, I made this friend as he sort of helped me uh, get these things to buy them. Um, the war syllabus didn't look that bad until he found the line where he assigned all of war and peace. Um, and Jacqueline Brown, who's here, who um, was Stanley's sort of chief of staff, at one point I saw her, she sort of, I was at office hours and she marched in waving a syllabus and said, Stanley, you are not doing this to these poor children. Um, the secret, though, was, um, as, as Louise's kids figured out uh, with the sort of, they're much smarter than we were, um, was that Stanley just, from up close, Stanley just liked the undergrads. It was on some level a sort of democratic education, a duty to the weak, a revulsion to sort of hierarchical teaching in France, but the, um, he thought we were fun, um, even when we really weren't. Um, <laughs> The, um, we had a million questions, some of them really genuinely not worth his time. But he was up close, unbelieva unbelievably forgiving. Uh, I, had, I had a friend who was puzzled by why uh, Bob Cohan's book was called After Germany. Um, and <laughs> not, a, not a professor level question. Um, <laughs> the, um, up, close he was, up close he was totally forgiving of uh, of human weakness. Um, he said, he announced uh, in, in Seaver in front of everybody um, that he would not give any extensions on the course papers. Um, but I had three other papers due that day and I was doing stuff on the Crimson and with sort of monumental arrogance of the undergrad, I thought that this was a professor level issue and I should go and ask if I can have an extension. I went up to him and said, could I have an extension? And suddenly he said, oh, of course. Um, I said, but you said nobody, you said, I have to, otherwise everyone will. Um, he, he has been rewarded for this kind of kindness by um, occasional gifts of cashmere socks. I got him a poster of the New World Order, which was a cartoon of George Bush saving, the, saving Kuwait, um, and also by several hundred thousand requests for letters of recommendation. <laughs> um, he, uh, um, he talked brilliantly, brilliantly, um, in a way that I've never seen in a way in which I think all of us uh, who are professors who have been Stanley students have the experience of getting up behind the, behind the podium and thinking how cheated our students are to get us essentially doing, even though unlike, unlike Michael, I won't do the voice, but it, essentially we're all doing Stanley imitations. It's just that our students don't know it. Stanley is coming to Princeton on Monday and all of my, under, you know, all of my students uh, will be showing up and realizing like, oh, that's what he's pretending to be. Um, <laughs> The, but part of the reason I think why he was such a brilliant teacher is he just took everyone seriously. So a friend of mine, an undergrad, read a, wrote a senior thesis on Camus and Stanley was the reader on it and he liked it and called my friend and asked him to come and quote to talk Camus. It's a terrifying prospect. Um, it was wonderful. Um, when I finally asked him to advise my senior thesis, um, which I was, by the way, this is how you mess with Stanley's head, the senior thesis was about, um, was about de Gaulle and Israel, and it basically pitted um, de Gaulle's decision to, to turn away from the Israelis in 1967 against Raymond Aron's argument that de Gaulle shouldn't have done that. 
So it was Iran versus De Gaulle. This is how you sort of mess with, this is how you mess with, about Israel. This is how you mess with Stanley's head. Um, but when I, when I asked him if he would, you know, if he would be willing to, under, to advise us in your thesis, um, he said, you know, he, he'd be very glad to, which is an extraordinary thing for a senior faculty at Harvard to do. That's not so normal. And then he asked me how much time this would require. And I, having no idea, having never written a senior thesis before, I said, well, I, I think an hour a week, right? And Stanley said, okay. And spent the rest of senior year desperately trying to fill up, you know, come up with things to fill up this hour. It never occurred to him to say, are you out of your mind? An hour a week is... <laughs> far is way too much time. So I came in with these, what do you think Coupe de Merville meant by this? Um, <laughs> the, um, and he would, we would have these sort of protracted, um, in this, uh, that office, with this magnificent office bursting with books and learning, had to walk through the museum to get there. Um, with a talk that would sort of start with de Gaulle, ça va sans dire, um, but also Le Pen, de Klerk, I took, I took notes. Israeli electoral reform, de Gaulle again. Mitterrand, uh, Malraux, Asterix, and the ways in which he resembled de Gaulle. Um, <laughs> but evidently, it was all a Gaullist allegory. Um, so finally, of course, I have to, uh, I have to, th there were three things that Stanley taught us by example. I want to highlight those, and then I will shut up. Um, the, because everything, of course, as everybody has pointed out, has been threes. Um, the first, th and he, this was surely by, uh, by demonstration. The first was that in order to think seriously about ethics, you needed to know um, the empirics. You needed to know the history. You needed to understand these places. Um, so his critique of realism, which is in uh, Duties Beyond Borders, in which he lectured about in Moral Reasoning 28, was that realism said you, uh, that states have their, their preferences dictated to them by, great, by moments of great international threat. And Stanley's point was, if you fine, if you look at the moment where states are under the greatest amount of threat, like France uh, in the 1930s, they understand that they should do what they should do for their survival. They just don't know what it is. And realism, therefore, becomes completely indeterminate. And as a theory, it tells you almost nothing about foreign policy. But this is the kind of example that you only get by knowing a lot about France. Um, so that, I think, was a lesson that we've all we've all tried to live up to. A second was that Stanley never despaired. Even when talking about the occupation, even when he talked today um, about Vichy, it wasn't in the tone of despair. And for the, you know, I was, I was in college for 1989, which is the moment of euphoria, but also when concentration, you know, as I graduated, there were concentration camps in Bosnia. Stanley didn't despair, so why should we despair? Um, and that was in itself an inspiration. And finally, that Stanley demanded that we think of ourselves as being part of a wider society and that as idyllic and as privileged as Harvard was and as lucky as we were to be there, um, and as well as our lives had gone out, not had gone not necessarily through any particular virtue of our own, that we had, it was therefore incumbent on us to do something to help out. That Stanley taught us not just how international politics looked from inside a foreign ministry, but also taught us that, as Aron put it, that states were cold-blooded monsters and that we had to see international politics from the receiving end, as Judas Schlar would say, who is much lamented and much missed today, uh, that we had to put cruelty first. He wrote, it is the need to understand and to make others understand a violent world that threatens at any moment to destroy any possibility of private happiness to make history fall like a roof lifted by a tornado on the inhabitants of the house. The need to understand the world, not in order to resign ourselves to its erratic and, and often awful ways, but to grasp the possibilities of improvement without illusions. And at the very end of his course, Moral Reasoning 28, this Ethics and International Affairs course, he concluded by saying that there was an awful lot of misery out there and said, quote, most of you are going to have very nice lives. Perhaps you could do something about it. And then he went out a side door in Seaver that I didn't even know was there and left all of us cl clapping to an empty room because the point was never the vanity of it, that he didn't want to stay around for his applause. Um, he was sort of, we were all wildly applauding at thin air while he was on his way back to CES. So, uh, Monsieur le Professeur, 
Um, we are intensely grateful. I speak for, I also, thanks for the PhD, but that's sort of least of it. Um, <laughs> the, um, but we're all enormously grateful. We're enormously in your debt. It is a joy, a pleasure, and a privilege uh, to be your former student, um, your eternal student, and your friend. Thank you. to the requisite tripartite remarks, it occurred to me to just start with a few personal memories. I won't worry if there are three or four. I'm just saying we'll get to the briefly later. But I did remark to Inga earlier that, uh, as the last speaker on the last panel, that I think we need a little levity. So I spent some time listening to my colleagues, looking at these pictures. Sorry. And trying to figure out if anything that I could recall from our past together might be depicted here. And I, I did find one, which I'll point out in a minute. In any case, like Gary, I was also an undergraduate. A bit earlier, I think, I enrolled at Radcliffe, which it then was, some people still think it is to us, in the fall of 1955, which means I would be celebrating, if I'm still upright, my 50th reunion from June. And I came into Stanley's world, or he came into mine, in my sophomore year when I enrolled in the course on France. He was at that time fresh from his military service and his coming back to Harvard. And on the basis of taking that course, I decided that I would pursue a, an undergraduate concentration in history and literature, which I did, and asked him to supervise my senior thesis, which he agreed to do. Now, in those days, of course, Radcliffe and Harvard students were much more impressive than they are now in that if you took the history and literature route, there were three countries you were expected to know something about. I gather subsequently there were only two. In any case, I had chosen America, Britain, and France in the modern period. So the thesis topic was a study of who said what, what else. And as you'll appreciate, there were ups and downs. Stanley by this time was used to undergraduates who would have moments of crisis, he would have to see us through. And I thought everything was going well, so much so that I asked Stanley for letters of recommendation to law school. And without missing a beat, he said to me, I think it was right here, I will not recommend you for law school. I was a bit undone by that because I thought the thesis was at least acceptable. Well, of course, it had nothing to do with the thesis at all, which he found was acceptable. It had to do with the fact that, as he said, quote, you'll be bored stiff. <laughs> I was very glad I took his advice then, and I've been taking it ever since. This, of course, put me into conflict with my managerial mother, who had earlier I think I was probably 12 or 13, in fact I know I was, taken me to Harvard Law School and insisted that my father drive through the campus there. As far as she was concerned, Radcliffe was preparation, you see, for Harvard Law School. And she explained to me at this tender age of 13, one day you will go here. She was just disappointed. Now, other memories come back as well. I'm not sure whether I can relate them to the pictures here. One was Stanley's insistence, which I think probably came to the fore during the writing of that undergraduate thesis, that the word however was to be banished. As he said, and I quote, the weakest word in the English language. 
When I served as editor of an ISA journal four years some time back, I informed all of our participants, contributors, and so on, right off the bat, including my managing editor. We compromised. He said, all right, I'll banish however from all the manuscripts if you allow me to put in whereas. <laughs> <laughs> that was the trade-off. But I'm happy to tell you that this morning, before departing from paradise, i.e. wealthy list, to come here, I was able to write to a senior at Brown, whose thesis I am now supervising, saying, I read your first draft. Lose the howevers. <laughs> Stanley was also enormously helpful to me at another stage of my career, when, for reasons that don't bear going into too much detail about, I was a graduate student at Columbia instead of here at Harvard. I was trying to find a thesis topic I thought I had, and I decided to run this by my <coughs> supposed advisors at Columbia, who informed me rather imperiously, that's not a topic, it's, it's not a subject. Uh, I ran it by Stanley, who said, but of course, fascinating topic, and I'm happy to tell you that with his help, it was later published by Princeton Press as World Order and Local Disorder, the United Nations and Civil Strife. Not a topic. <laughs> Finally, over the years, we've had some wonderful lunches and dinners together. Stanley always appreciates a good meal preferably in French or in Cambridge, with the disappearance of Chez Henri, <laughs> pseudo-French, shall we say, <coughs> places. And I remember particularly when I invited him to be my guest at a dinner, just the two of us, shortly after he was named to his university professorship. And we were chatting about various things. And he remarked to me, which I've never forgotten, I could not be appointed as a professor in any American political science department today. I found this to be enormously insightful, but sad. I have a feeling that perhaps things have changed a bit, at least from what we heard in the first panel today. Now, more seriously, because indeed, as we all know, there have to be three take-home messages, so to speak. In an email, Stanley referred to the event, and we heard just a few moments ago, as free posthumous. So I thought I'd like to speak of his bequest to us, just to follow out that theme. And all of these bequests, I think, were foreshadowed in the festrip which Michael and I were honored to present to Stanley exactly 15 years ago today. <coughs> and may I say, I think that these lessons have been reinforced in the last 15 years, these requests, if I can call it that. And I do appreciate all the mentions that have been made of the book. So uh, without any embarrassment, I will simply give you the title. <coughs> it's called Ideas and Ideals, Essays on Politics in Honor of Stanley Hoffman, Westview Press, 1993. You can still find it in various libraries. And I've so enjoyed today seeing fellow contributors here, all of whom have sneakily admitted that they pulled the book down <laughs> from a dusty shelf to prepare for today. And we found much that we could still enjoy reading 15 years later. So what are these bequests uh, to which I earlier referred? First, I think his incredibly productive intellectual life, as we've heard today, marked by an insistence that we find our own voices. I think all of our speakers today and others in the audience too will agree. We've learned that lesson very well collectively. Second, and perhaps even as undergraduates, we appreciated this even more. His insistence that we tolerate ambiguity. That ambiguity is, in fact, 
to be embraced. It is the only realistic approach to life, as well as political science, which, of course, he would insist and I would agree, is not science at all. Third, of course, his unwavering loyalty to his ideas and his ideals, and to us, his students and his friends. I remember Dina Sklar being in awe of this trait, although, of course, she was a prime beneficiary of it herself. So, dear mentor, we salute you, and we wish you at least one more decade of active enjoyment of life so that we may gather again to renew our wonderful ties with you. Thank you. Charles Kogan. Uh, I'm uh, both a student of Stanley Hoffman. He was my thesis advisor, and yet we're the same age. Uh, in 1950, so we have sort of this uh, dialectical relationship. He's my guru, and he's my friend. We had a two-hour lunch yesterday, and it's been a wonderful relationship for near, nearly 20 years. In <laughs> and, and thanks to Louise, uh, it suddenly occurs to me what we have in common. We are both outsiders. Uh, King Hassan II of Morocco once called me a dangerous outsider as he was pinning a medal on me. <laughs> in 1954, the, the uh, Harvard sent me to the agency, CIA that is, with the letters of introduction also to other U.S. departments, and uh, I spent uh, uh, 37 years in the agency, 23 of them overseas, again developing this outsider mentality. So in 1989, I was chief of station in Paris, and uh, the agency sent me to the Kennedy School as a research fellow. And uh, I came with a letter of introduction from uh, Jean-Claude Casanova, editor of Commentaire, with a boost from Nancy Huntington. And at that time, Stanley was doing a seminar on Charles de Gaulle. And I had just come off the three volumes of La Couture on de Gaulle. And I asked Stanley if I could order his course. And he said, yes, with one condition, you have to write a paper. So I've been writing papers and books uh, ever since. And uh, I must say, uh, my, my vision of what uh, Stanley has as guidance is the following. Guidance is encouragement. You have to look very deeply into what he is saying for, to find something that is discouraging. And finally, I'd like to say that uh, <coughs> it was thanks to Stanley that I was able to uh, uh, be awarded a contract to write uh, for the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, the book on French negotiating behavior in their series on how foreign countries negotiate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Judy Vishniak. Um, I'm Judy Vishniak, and uh, Stanley and I have uh, been connected in many ways, w the first being that my thesis, my then thesis advisor, Barrington Moore became ill and decided that he could not finish <coughs> advising my thesis, and Stanley was willing to take me on um, many uh, four years into the whole process, which was extremely kind of him. Then I came back, and I was the head section person for the Fran France course, and as Michael said, you learn so much in that role. I, um, the lectures on Tocqueville, the lectures on the French Revolution as a block, I still kind of hear ringing in my ears. But the one thing that I want to go back to is something that David Blackburn said. There are many, many, many people in this room who have had connections to social studies, either as students, as teachers, even a past chair, another past chair. And the brilliance with which uh, that undergraduate program was put together and has held a pretty much, um, you know, the vision has changed over the years. It would be terrible if it didn't. But I can't go anywhere without meeting students at universities, um, in the streets in New York. I just went to the movies on Saturday night and an old social studies student came running over <coughs> telling me what so, so, you know, Social Studies 10 did for her. Um, so the progeny of that creation, of that, if we can call an institution, um, has had a, and a dramatically important imprint on academic life and non-academic life. 
And for that, um, I think all the social studies people in the room have to be incredibly grateful. Thank you. I was a, uh, a crazed student radical in 1969. I'm ashamed to admit it in front of all my friends, but it's true. <laughs> I, I was actually moderately crazy, which uh, I was only slightly crazy. A lot of these people were really crazy. I was <laughs> uh, but I want to say something about Stanley, which is actually very serious. Stanley and I were on the first student faculty committee that ever existed in in Harvard's history. I don't know whether there's been another one after this one because <laughs> it didn't succeed. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and then, well, I was the leader of the crazies on that committee, I believe. Uh, and then the university was threatened, Mr. Pusey, and a lot of people didn't understand what was happening, including a lot of people on the faculty. It wasn't, Ellen, only the institution and us the institution itself was coming apart at that point, and a lot of people in the faculty didn't understand what was going on. They were perplexed. A lot were angry, and many were playing games, as <coughs> faculty members always do. And it led to some very, very serious business of which, in which I did not, I, I was cured at some point, and I didn't partake. I had a migraine the day that <coughs> Harvard strike began. But through all this experience and the massive meeting at the Harvard Stadium, which nobody's mentioned, it was one of the most important events in my life, where Barry Moore, my advisor, stood up, and I think Stanley stood up, and said things that finally got through to me. I think <coughs> from Stanley Hoffman and a few, a very few other people in this institution at that point in time, I learned something about academic freedom, and I learned something about liberalism. And I think if I hadn't, if I hadn't learned that, I would be a very different person, but I think if the institution hadn't been able to learn that during this period. And Stanley was one of the very few people who spoke those words in a way that was credible. I think uh, the world might have been somewhat different. I think we owe Stanley a lot more than simply having been students. <laughs> two courses with Stanley in the last few years. Uh, 
One was on the 1930s, where we did a lot of literature and history and film. Uh, and the other was on War and Memory, where Stanley could actually talk about what it was like. Uh, he actually had memories of being in France during the war. And it was just an incredible uh, sort of uh, moment you know, to, to, for these young students to, to have somebody <coughs> who could say, well, yes, I was, I was there. Uh, and, but I just want to say a couple of other things, because I have a few other memories. When I was a graduate student here in the 60s, Stanley was, I think, probably one of the most sort of uh, brilliant figures that one could sort of he was this young, exciting professor, and I, I would go to teach it and whatever. Uh, I never took a course with him. I mean, I was doing French literature and, and comparative literature, but somehow the idea of Stanley was extremely important to me as a, uh, as a student. And then when I came back to Harvard many years later, in the, well, in the early 80s, uh, it, you were one of the first people that I actually had lunch with. Uh, and then we started the Women's Studies program, and I, I was actually chairing the committee. Remember that? And in, in 1986, I had to get up in our faculty meeting and present the case for creating a department of women's studies, which is now a thriving department on women, gender, and sexuality. But anyway, and I, uh, and I remember, as, and I think we had either lunch or we saw each other, and Stan, I said to Sunny, would you please uh, second, or you know, would you please speak in favor of this motion? And he absolutely, immediately said, yes, uh, absolutely, I will. And he made one of his great uh, sort of speeches in the faculty meetings, which are, nobody has really talked about them, but when Stanley gets up at a FAS faculty meeting, there's always a sort of a silent pause moment as people wait for him to say, and he said, well, I wasn't going to say anything today, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that seems to how he begins his statement. I wasn't planning to say anything, but uh, uh, although that day he did, and, and it was just an absolutely marvelous moment. Uh, and my final thing, I don't know if anyone has mentioned what a sine uh Stanley yeah. is, yeah. which I had the great, uh, and I guess Inga too, uh, the great pleasure of finding this out in the 1930s course, he had seen every film that Jean Gabin <laughs> that was ever made, <laughs> and all other films made in France during the, uh, in the last 50 years. So, uh, so I was truly, I was truly astounded. Uh, thank you. are no longer in the academy, 
but who studied with Stanley and have taken this aspect of him as a model. He stands as a significance for what we came to Harvard for, what Harvard used to represent, and what we hope that someday it might once again represent. And for that, he's sort of like somebody in a medieval monastery carrying <laughs> the torch <laughs> and playing of what a serious public intellectual engaging with international relations can and should be that we all want to try to emulate. like Stanley at the faculty meetings, I wasn't going to say anything, but I suddenly <laughs> realized <laughs> that I am in a u unique position in that I represent two generations who have been involved with Stanley. Firstly, uh, for many years I was Harvard's last PhD in the literature of the French Renaissance, not a girl's industry. And, <laughs> <laughs> and like, and, yes, <laughs> and like uh, Char I, I came, I was a re-entry PhD. And, uh, and then my husband was very ill, and I had these three adolescent children. And I was trying to keep my finger in. And Stanley welcomed me to the very early days of the Center for European Studies, a place where I could try out other areas and so on, and try and manage to keep my career going. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. And secondly, he also uh, told me about the Bellagio connection, which was mentioned, the Bellagio uh, Center, where I've twice been a fellow, and it's, it's so extraordinary. But then my son, my oldest son, was Stanley's uh, undergraduate advisee, and he was also involved in his PhD. <coughs> so, as I say, I represent two generations uh, in the family indebted to Stanley, this wonderful, generous teacher. A very brief comment from someone who knows Stanley only very recently, but I want to say that uh, 
people are bringing uh, old memories back, which is, of course, wonderful and appropriate. But there's lots and lots of young people, undergraduates and current <coughs> graduate students, who going forward will have all these same sorts of memories. And they're not represented here, but I'd just like to remind us all of that. Because the extraordinary thing about Stanley's career is that it's still going. He's still vigorous. He's involved. He's engaged. Uh, earlier this year, I sent an unsolicited, unnamed 400-page manuscript to him. <laughs> uh, how many of you would have read it carefully and gotten back to him about it? Stanley Hoffman did. So <laughs> this is what I'm That's what one does if one is a, 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 a teacher, no? What other reason is there? Uh, there is a wonderful institution in France, which is the CNRS, which of course is present with the most of it now, uh, probably because it costs a lot of money, but in which you can spend your whole life without ever having any school. Uh, I, I couldn't have done it. Uh, just as when she was offered the uh, position at the Institute of Advanced Study at uh, Princeton, we uh, refused to go because she, needed stu she wanted students. And the relationship wasn't always very easy between her and her. She wasn't always uh, the most diplomatic. <laughs> However, they still, when I meet them, I, I say, you know, I spent all my time wondering what she would have said of this or that. What would she say about this? <laughs> so to me, this has been indeed uh, the most uh, uh, important thing in being an academic. It, it, it's uh, having students and uh, to be very immodest, trying to teach them something about how to think. What they do once they know that is absolutely their business. It's not my business found a school or to tell them about. I, I don't like clothes. I mean, I really do not. This being said, I was very lucky. I was very lucky to have a model, Raymond Aron, who was never my teacher. He, wasn't, he didn't have a chair at the time I was still a student in France. We met, met in a train, going to in a political science meeting in Holland. He was. Uh, uh, he went as Raymond Aron. I went as a graduate student, needing a bit of money, and uh, uh, just, uh, and uh, I went there to make to translate uh, people in, in this meeting, which I did, which I found actually quite a demanding task. 
until the day came when I suddenly realized that the audience was laughing all around me. I was translating one of my law school professors, who was a profound <coughs> law and all. Uh, I was translating him into French. <laughs> <laughs> I was tired. <laughs> that was a, a great moment. <laughs> uh, so, but Aron was an extraordinary model. Uh, precisely because he never tried to impose his ideas on anybody. And because of his absolutely encyclopedic knowledge, I mean, nobody, not even uh, the, his favorite uh, uh, student, Pierre Asner, had arranged that Aron had. And he had this extraordinary fondness for, uh, for teaching. So that, um, you know, so, so I, I went, I saw him usually in his apartment overlooking the, the Seine. Um, and I would uh, say, what's on my mind? And he would say, vous n'avez rien compris. <laughs> Je vais vous expliquer. <laughs> and there followed a 45 minute lecture uh, improvised, and, and I learned more from these meetings than I learned from any of my teachers. The other good piece of luck I had, and again it's a tribute to education I got in France, was wonderful historian. Uh, so that I've never been able even to conceive of a political science separated from history. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, maybe because I was never particularly good at mathematics, but I mean, all those columns of, 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 of figures, you know, uh, these days in my department, I hope my, my <laughs> uh, Everybody whom we interview for, for junior positions has to come with a model. You know, you carry a model. Uh, and then you don't discuss the subject which uh, uh, is supposed to be the, uh, the object of the model. You discuss the model. Where is reality in any of them? But fortunately, they are in my department. I see one of them. There are a few people still uh, who remember history. Uh, so I wish that uh, now that we meet, perhaps within the next uh, 20 years or so, I want to cure ourselves of our, of our economics at least. And now that the economists are beginning, perhaps, to ask a question, <laughs> <laughs> we'll take 10 more years. Uh, but I've enjoyed what I've been doing. And then one of the nice things about Harvard is that you can live with it, do what you like, especially if you have the good fortune of being a university professor. They can teach in any part of the university. It's a great privilege. But I think I would have managed even if I had not been. And the pleasure of teaching with such people as Brian Hare, my two colleagues from the French department, uh, uh, Michael uh, Smith when he was at Peter Hall, where we taught a course uh, with uh, a third person who started with the fall of the Roman Empire, and we went all the way to the 20th century, comparative politics. It's a wonderful privilege. I have enjoyed that immensely. And then, you know, just the pleasure of having uh, inquisitive students, like this little guy who came after every lecture of the course I was giving with Charles Mayer, uh, to challenge everything I had said. Uh, he's sitting here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I got so uh, fond of him because you know, in France, it's inco it would have been inconsistent. He would tell me at the end of every lecture why I hadn't been fair to Israel, why I hadn't been this, that. And he was clearly interested in, in, in substance. Uh, and that's what I liked about so many of the students. And, and uh, it's only uh, sooner or later, I imagine, now be dead, or retired, or C9, or all of the three. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been an extraordinary experience. And uh, I can only thank all of you for the very kind words. And one of the great things it did for me to, to sit through this, I didn't think it would be very comfortable sitting through all of it. But one of the reasons why I think it, it was uh, 
very educational, is that I no longer have any desire to attend my own service. <laughs> and having gone to a number of very remarkable services, but that isn't it too bad that I've never been able to hear what they say about me. <laughs> no longer necessary. <laughs> thank you all. Really, thank you very much. There's food and there's food and or at least there's drink if not there's drink if not food upstairs. So you're all invited to a reception. Yes, we announced this already. And there's a pair of eyeglasses, rose-colored glasses. We did. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for doing that. I kind of guessed it would be great. I guess what?